imagine for a moment your big goal in life. Go ahead and close your eyes. Good. Now call it up into your mind. There it is. Your dream. Your vision. Your reason for being. Beautiful, isn't it? All shiny and filled with promise. Maybe it's opening a restaurant. Maybe it's writing a novel. Maybe it's getting a college degree, an advanced degree, a high school diploma. You can open your eyes now. I want you to think about all the things you've done to make that dream a reality. The sweat equity, the education, the debt, the research and planning, the budgeting, the time, the sacrifice. Perhaps you've put off starting a family or getting married. Or maybe, on the other hand, you've spent hours and hours away from your family dedicating yourself to this purpose greater than yourself. And then reality sets in. The market isn't big enough to support your restaurant and all the others in your community. No one wants to publish your book. You don't have time to go back to school. Everywhere you turn, there's a holdup, an interruption, a wall, and you feel utterly boxed in. And then you start to wonder, how can this dream of yours really be your destiny with all these constraints? I have found myself in this situation many times in my life, but where I used to dread those walls, I've come to look at them differently. I'm not going to go so far as to say that I like them, but I've come to appreciate how scaling them has made me stronger and my dream more viable. Today, I want to talk to you about the magic that happens when you're forced to innovate under constraint. How through resilience, perseverance, and flexibility, you can make big things happen. Not in spite of being boxed in, but because of being boxed in. I want to talk to you about, in my life, how constraint has led me to developing my vision in a way I never could have conceived otherwise, and how doing things on a smaller scale can result in limitless possibilities. To give you a bit of a background on me, I'm an occupational therapist, otherwise known as an OT. In my field, we aim to help people be as independent as possible in their daily lives with activities that are meaningful and purposeful to the individual. OTs work with a variety of people, from the stroke and brain injured to people with autism spectrum and learning disorders. Basically, anyone with an injury, an illness, or a congenital deformity or disease that impacts their ability to function, engage, or interact with people and the world around them. I am a pediatric OT. I specialize in education and I work with struggling students. It's my job to identify the underlying causes for a student's academic struggles. What is it that's making it so hard for them to learn? You see, our brains are like organic computers and the connection between our processing equipment, our eyes, ears, mouth, nose, and fingertips can sometimes be faulty or underdeveloped. By working with kids on their processing skills, I can often help to rewire disconnected networks and make new connections to improve their processing and decision making. This is an exciting field to be in as we are just touching on what is possible and there's tremendous room for growth and innovation as we continue to learn and understand the brain and the body. Excuse me. So I'm a big dreamer. I always have been. I want to heal the world through OT. Some people say I'm ambitious. I want to share what I've learned to help as many children and their families as possible. So about 10 years ago, I got my big vision. It was a true aha moment. I was going to open an indoor playground that also served as a therapy clinic right here on the mountain. It would offer something unique and different, but ultimately it would provide a valuable service to one of our most vulnerable populations, developmentally challenged children. Excuse me. I'm not gonna lie to you. My aspirations went way beyond a single location. I thought that if someday everyone saw how useful it was, 
I'd franchise it. It would be lucrative for me and it would change the lives of millions of children. I would write a book, I'd go on Oprah, I would become a talking head on the morning news show circuit. I was dreaming big all right. But there were some problems. First, I needed money. Second, I needed a location. And third, I needed to consider whether my small town could sustain such a business. And here's where my vision began to lose its edge. Was I going to have to move my business to a bigger city to make it work? Well, that defeated my purpose. I wanted something for my town, my community. This is where my husband was born and raised. This is where my children were born and are being raised. I wanted them to benefit from it too. And if it was far away, that wasn't going to happen. I was still committed to my dream, but in order to make it fit into the box I was in, I needed to create and innovate. I had to modify it to fit my financial restraints, the constraints of my small town, and the self-imposed constraints I set upon myself in order to meet the time, protect the time that I needed for my family. And it was in this box, it was because of this box, that I began to think differently about my dream and all the possibilities. These constraints forced me to look at my dream from a different angle. I needed to consider not only what I wanted to achieve, but also what was best for the people of my community. Sorry. It was forced innovation. Because my options were few, my resources were limited, and I had to make do with what I had, I was forced to home in on something I could actually create and refine that into something great. I found that what I really wanted to accomplish was less about the big fancy building and more about bringing the benefits of OT to children who needed it, but who didn't have access. So with that goal as my guide, I decided to look around and see what I could do to make that happen in a way different from my original vision. Sorry. So did you know that according to the National Center for Learning Disabilities, in the 2015-2016 school year, that one in five students struggled with learning and attention issues, but that only one in 16 students receive special education services for disabilities like dyslexia or ADHD. This leaves a gaping hole between the served and underserved population of struggling students. As a volunteer in my children's classroom, I encountered the group of children I had envisioned coming to my facility. Here they were the underserved, the overlooked, the exact population of children who could benefit from some simple developmental activities to improve their processing skills. And as I volunteered, I saw children who struggled with emotional and attention issues, children who couldn't control their emotional outbursts, children who couldn't sit still long enough to complete their assigned tasks. You know who I'm talking about. You've seen them as well. But I also saw children who were the polar opposite. These children were the silent strugglers who kept to themselves. They were not disruptive. In fact, you barely noticed them. And because of this fact, it was too easy to miss the fact that they were not keeping up with the learning pace of their peers. What I was seeing, what I am seeing, is that many children are falling through the cracks and Teachers are struggling to help them. My experience elsewhere tells me this problem is not unique to my small town. This was the problem I was ultimately trying to solve. So when I was approached by a teacher, I was very excited to see what I could do to help. This teacher taught a fifth and sixth grade combination class with 20 boys and five girls. 15 of the 20 boys received special education services, or were struggling learners, and they all had behavioral issues. 
Providing OT services to just the struggling learners was not an option. So I put together a daily whole classroom plan that consisted of OT intervention tools and activities that I use with my OT students. And the teacher implemented this on a daily basis. It's important to note that having an entire classroom participate in OT activities on a daily basis is extremely uncommon. And the fact that it's so uncommon is what I'm committed to changing because guess what? The improvements to overall classroom behavior were well beyond what I ever expected or could have hoped for. How long do you think it took before the teacher began to see improvements? A month? Two months? Try three days. Yep. Three days after implementing our plan, I decided to check in. There was a substitute teacher that day, but she knew who I was, and she came straight over to me and said, this is a completely different class from when I last saw them three months ago. They are so calm and quiet. I couldn't even tell you who the troublemakers were. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Three days after implementing our plan, the student's behavior had turned around drastically. And while it wasn't a cure-all for these students, the OT plan helped them and their teacher get through the rest of the school year in a more organized fashion, and they were all better able to process and learn. As word spread about my unique approach to learning, another teacher approached me and asked me to, to help in her third grade class. Again, I provided some simple OT tools and interventions that I use with my students, and she implemented the, the routine into her daily classroom uh, routine, excuse me. She implemented the activities and the plan into her daily classroom routine. This teacher benefited so much that she started sharing the program with her, with her peers. And this past school year, all third grade classes at the school were required to participate in one of the OT interventions that focused on movement, sequencing, timing, and rhythm. Furthermore, the school has since started a longitudinal study to see how this is directly affecting their academic outcomes. The implementation is still in its infancy, but I am so excited to see where this takes us. You guys, I started with a dream, one that was outside my reach and seemed too far, uh, sorry, excuse me, one that was outside of my means and seemed too far out of reach. But by modifying my method to fit the box I was in, I was able to reach children to a degree and in a capacity I didn't realize was possible. By empowering and teaching others, I've been able to create an organic structure which has given my OT interventions a life of their own. How cool is that? As an innovator in the OT space, I feel like I'm just getting started. I urge you to take your dreams, your passions, your ideas, and make them happen. Start small, find an entry point, and take it one step at a time. Use your imagination, be creative, be innovative, and also be flexible. While I'm doing my magic in the OT world, take your dreams, your passions, your ideas, and do your magic in your world. The next time you find yourself in a box, instead of looking in front of you and behind you or to the sides, look up and you will find that the sky's the limit for what you can do. Thank you.